is talk about talk about this program. Sorry, it just told me it was recording. Um, and so um, I'm going to ask Katie, if you can give me about a 15 minute heads up, like when I've only got 15 minutes left, just in case I'm running over and I can figure out where how to wrap this up a little bit better. Um, for some of you folks, uh, Amanda, I've, I've worked a little bit with Amanda in the community. Some of you may have seen me do a similar presentation in the past. What I will tell you is this program is constantly changing. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the Fort Hood and Vanessa Guillen later on in the presentation, but um, I tweaked this uh, presentation for today, and then a few days after that, we got uh, a Department of Defense instruction change with a whole bunch of changes that happened as well. So when I say it's constantly changing, we had a form change three times in one day because of these Department of Defense changes that rolled out one right after the other. So um, I can promise you that if you see me speak on this program in three months, it will likely be different again. Um, so again, thank you for having me here. Um, I wanna start off by saying that this is definitely a complex program. There are a lot of moving parts and a lot more in the National Guard. And so when we leave here today, my, my intent is not to have you be experts at what we do, but to have a good understanding about the complexity of our program and if at minimum, just at least know who to call, right? If you have questions, if you're working with one of our members who maybe didn't feel comfortable reaching out to our program um, and you just need some military 101 to understand what they're saying, then I would be um, the person to reach out to myself or the Joint Force Headquarters, Sark, and I'll explain that after. Excuse me. So um, in my position, I am what we refer to as the SARC. That is an acronym for Sexual Assault Response Coordinator. Um, and of course, in the military, we have acronyms for everything. Uh, and I'm going to use some of them today, and I'll probably use some and not even realize that I've used them. So if that happens and um, you want, and you're questioning what that uh, acronym may be, then by all means, please ask me. Um, however is most comfortable for this group, either in the chat and, and we can get to it after or what have you, because uh, I certainly don't want to leave anybody in the dust. So my job, I am the SARC, that stands for SARC, Sexual Assault Response Coordinator, and I manage the program that's called SAPR, Sexual Assault Prevention and Response, and we just refer to it as SAPR, um, for the Maine Air National Guard. This is a Department of Defense program that every military branch is required to have and operate under, um, but some of the branches, you know, have their little quirks and differences. So um, a lot of people, I, we will hear oftentimes people will call it the SARC program, and it's actually the SAPR program. Um, I don't get too too wound up about that difference because I am the SARC and I do manage the program, so that's okay. But um, if you're looking for a way to remember which is which, SARC is the, pro the person, SAPR is the program, P program, SAPR, if that works, that works for you, right? Um, I have a team of volunteer victim advocates that work with me. Um, we have three credentialed right now and four more to be credentialed in the next couple of months as we just did a 40 hour class last week. Um, and we call them VVAs, so Volunteer Victim Advocates, and you'll hear me hear me say that. Um, I'm not going to bore you with my entire resume uh, as far as working in this field, but what I will um, let you know is that I have worked with this program in one form or another, whether that's volunteer victim advocate or as a full-time paid advocate and now the sexual assault response coordinator since 2008. Um, and the program has just gone through insane, amazing changes in that time frame. Um, and I, I can say each change is always for the better and we don't know what we don't know until we realize we didn't know it, right? And so we, we jump on it and we try to make those changes as best we can um, when it's necessary. Uh, and what will be important for you folks to, to um, know is just that there are changes and that when you work with one of our members, it's going to look very different um, in some capacities. Um, and in other capacities, it's going to be like working with um, other victims who experience sexual trauma or sexual violence in any form. 
And another thing to point out is that um, we have different branches in the state of Maine. Unlike some states where they have huge active duty bases, you may not um, have the opportunity to interact with a lot of active duty folks, but you might have that opportunity with some folks. So it's important to understand um, that there are others in, in and around the state of Maine. So this is just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm not going to line by line that. So let's talk about military branches and rank structure first. And Katie, if there are any questions pop into the chat that I don't notice, by all means, just jump in and have me stop. Okay, sounds good. We don't get to, like if somebody is specific to what we're talking about, I don't want to get too far past that and then not remember what it was pertaining to. Sure, can do. Okay. Okay, so military branches, um, you've all known somebody or cried at the videos that they show on TV when the military folks are coming home, right? But it's some, some way you've all been connected with military members in one way or another. Um, so when we look at our structure, it's based on a hierarchy and it is specific to each branch and even our ranks are different. We won't get into the exact ranks, but just to understand the differences between officers and enlisted. Um, when we're looking at a regular active duty branch, typically the, well, not typically, the POTUS is the boss, right? So POTUS is the president of the United States and he or she someday <laughs> uh, is the boss for the military, right? They are the commander in chief. Um, and so under these active duty branches, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force falls other branches, right? So under the Army, the Army Reserve fall under the active duty Army. Under the United States Navy is the Marine Corps, and then the Navy Reserves and the Marine Corps Reserves. Under the Air Force is now the Space Force and the, the Air Force Reserves. It is really important to um, kind of know that the, um, the reserves are not the same as the National Guard. Uh, for the reserves, they are always in what we call a Title X status. Don't get wound around that, that term too much, but it's important to know that the reservists are always in a Title X status and that the POTUS is always their boss. Never is anybody else ever their boss except POTUS, right? I've highlighted the Coast Guard in a different color because it's really important to understand that the Coast Guard has a really unique role in how in, in the part that they play in our defense in, for this country, right? So typically, Monday through Friday on the average day, they actually fall under the Department of Homeland Defense. But they can be activated by the Department of Defense, in which case they would fall under the DOD instead of Homeland Security. Um, and who they fall under actually will speak to their benefits. So similar to the National Guard, the Coast Guard, the, the benefits and support that they receive is going to be based on the status that they're in. Um, again, don't get so wrapped around the, the axle about that because it's Look, I've been in, in this organization for over 22 years and I still am going, oh, I didn't know that, right? So I'm still learning. So don't get too wrapped up in that, but understand that there are some differences. Um, let's move on here. Okay, oh, that's two, I didn't want two. Okay, so we looked at the active duty branches and then there's us, the National Guard. And most of the folks that you're going to work with in the state of Maine are going to be National Guard members. We do have some, some Navy Reserve and um, some Army Reserve here in the state of Maine, but they're very small units and they report to their active duty SARC um, in terms of this program. That doesn't mean they won't work with you folks, um, but in terms of who they report to it's, or who they would file a report with, it would look very different. So for the National Guard, um, <laughs> depending on what, you know, quote unquote status we fall in is going to, is going to be determined by who our boss is at the time. So if we are on just our regular, like citizen soldier time, and that's how we're referred to as citizen soldiers, uh, we are in what they call a title 32 status. All right. And the titles just determine which laws pertain and who's paying the bill, right? There's all these pots of money and 
Um, it's just like within our state government, there's different titles within our laws and our regulations and statutes, and it all just determines all of that. So um, there are times when straight up, no kidding, Governor Mills is our boss and nobody else is. But there's also a portion of the time where POTUS could be our boss. And depending on this status, um, well, that status is going to determine what we can receive for services and support, medical support, all of these types of things, okay? This in and of itself could be a two-week course and we probably still wouldn't cover everything, um, but this is really, um, it's big in the news right now. Um, we can share later on, uh, link the Katie, that, that um, House Armed Services Committee hearing yesterday, um, was actually, they recorded it. So if you didn't get a chance to watch it, you can go back and watch it later. Um, we actually, our chief of the National Guard Bureau, who's a four-star general and the chief of the Office of Complex Investigations testified yesterday in front of the House Armed Services Committee, specifically speaking to jurisdiction and prosecution for sexual assault cases for National Guard members and what some of our challenges are in, how and why we can and cannot do certain things. Um, so let's let's look at that a little bit more. Let me just check some here. So can before we go on, yes, ma'am. Um, given there are so many statuses, <clears throat> will someone in front of you always know what status they're in? If an yes. advocate asks, no. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> what I can tell you is that. Um, because there are so many statuses, they might be able to tell you, hey, I'm on 502F COVID orders, or I'm on a Title 10 MPA tour. They might be able to say those words, but they may not understand truly what support that comes with, right? Like a lot of folks don't even realize that, so 502F COVID orders, um, that's a state act of duty. Uh, and in a way, not exactly, but in a way, it's kind of like being employed by the state. It's not an active duty status. It's a state active duty. So um, if somebody were to get hurt, it would be covered under a workman's comp type of a thing versus a, an active duty, line of duty determination kind of thing. Um, so would they know, they would, they would know what their status was. They probably would have a hard time, especially in that moment of trauma, they would probably have a hard time remembering and understanding all of the support that comes with that and the benefits. That makes a lot of sense, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's actually a really good point and a really good reason as to why it's important to reach out to one of us to ask those questions if you're working with somebody. Even if that person doesn't wanna work with us, you can ask those questions without telling us who you're working with. You absolutely can, can, can call and say, hey, Bobby Joe, I'm working with somebody in the main National Guard. You don't even have to differentiate Army and Air. Um, and these are some struggles we're looking at. And I'm looking at their orders and it says this title or they showed me it says this title. And we'll help figure out that piece of it after. Um, so yeah, so that's actually a really good, a good thing. Um, do we have any other questions before I go forward? We're going to just touch on rank a little bit. Okay. So rank, um, I want to talk to you about position versus rank. So in, the, in our rank structure, I'm going to read something verbatim because this is like the truly the definition of um, what our rank system speaks to, okay? Uh, so just bear with me, please. Military ranks are a system of hierarchical relationships within an armed forces, police, intelligence agencies, or other institutions that are organized along military lines. The military rank system defines dominance, authority, and responsibility in a military hierarchy, end quote. So this is military rank as it's described in Wikipedia. And this really is a, it's, it's a good way to explain it. Um, and speaking specifically to the military, not the other organizations that was mentioned in that, that description, we have two classifications for rank. Um, we have the enlisted rank structure and we have the officer rank structure. So the differences between these two, they can be vast, but in a nutshell, um, we could really break it down by saying, generally speaking, the enlisted structure, the enlisted force 
has, they have specific specialties. They are craftsmen in their trades, if you will. Um, they have a very specific job with a very specific set of skills. Officers are the managers of those personnel. And so don't, don't get me wrong, officers definitely have their specialty as well, right? We can't look at a pilot and say, well, they don't really have a technical skill because they have a very technical skill. Um, but officers are, generally speaking, the managers of the enlisted force structure. Um, and so that's just kind of a, a good way to look at that, you know, the higher, the top of the food chain, I guess, if you will. So when we're talking about enlisted folks, we use the letter E in front of it, and then there's numbers one through nine that, that speak to the rank, right? So we have E1 through E9, um, and that's the higher, highest you can go is E9. And the higher you go in rank, whether we're talking officer or enlisted, the less of you there are, right? Um, or the less of them there are. So we, we might have 200 E5s in a unit, but only three E8s and maybe one E9, right? Because the, the higher you go in the, the chain, you're getting more to the management piece of things. So you need more worker bees, and just one queen bee. And I'm sure my male chiefs would not be happy with me calling them queen bees, but I am for today. <laughs> um, and so our highest ranking enlisted person is called a chief master sergeant. So then we have the officers uh, and the officer ranks, we start that with an O, right, for officer. Um, and they go from one through 10. Um, enlisted is one through nine, officer is one through 10. And same thing, the higher you go up in rank, the, um, the less of that rank you're going to have, right? So we, we start to hit the flag officers at the 07 level. So that would be admirals and the Coast Guard in the Navy side of the house, and then generals for the Marine Corps, Army, and Air Force, and Space Force now, I guess, as well. Um, so you, probably, you might be asking yourself, why am I telling you about rank? Um, Rank sometimes plays a huge part in the trauma that happens to a military member who experiences sexual violence. Um, and the, the VA even speaks to that a bit. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but it's really important to understand that there is a rank structure and that rank structure um, oftentimes speaks to the mindset of that victim survivor. Right. When when somebody walks into your office and says, my first sergeant is the one who didn't believe me to you, uh, if you're not familiar with the military ranks, that. To you might just be some person didn't believe them, but if we translate it into civilian speak, that would be like me walking in and telling you that I was assaulted and my mom didn't believe me. It's that kind of a relationship, right? And so um, when you understand how, when you understand that rank plays a fa huge factor in the trauma in, within military sexual trauma, it's, it might be easier for you to help support. So let's talk about some timelines. First, we're gonna look at some icky stuff and then we're gonna look at some, some pro progression, forward progression of the program. I'm seeing some stuff in the chat. Is that for me, Katie, or? No, nope, just me. I'm just oh, writing. Just, just, okay. okay. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So we will talk about some timelines. So I started this chart here. Um, and if you have the printout, you, you can make some notes on it if you'd like. I went from 91 to 2020. When I first built this chart, it was a really great chart. Um, since I started this one, we've had a whole bunch more things happen. And I will tell you that sexual assault did not start in 1991 in the military. This is just where I chose to start this timeline. Um, in fact, the Veterans Administration treats numerous veterans for military sexual trauma. Um, there, the, as a matter of fact, the Vet Center was started for Vietnam veterans who were not specific to military sexual trauma, but who were struggling with PTS issues. And, and some of it did stem from sexual assault, um, but there was no place for them to go at the time. So recognize that, you know, you all know you work in this, this work. Um, this is not a new thing. This is 
been something that we've all had to struggle with since the dawn of time, right? And it's just a matter of how do we get through it? So if we look at the timeline, starting at 90, 1991, there was the tail hook. <laughs> and I'm going to refer to these as scandals because this is what they're called. Publicly and officially on the books, they're called scandals. I have a hard time calling a sexual assault a scandal because it's an assault, it's a crime. A scandal isn't always a crime, it's sometimes it's just scandal, right? Um, but this is how they're officially referred to, so know that I'm not happy saying it, but this is, this is it. So the tailhook um, assaults happened in Las Vegas at an aviation convention. And by the end of the proceedings and everything that, that followed, there were um, 83 women and seven men who had been sexually assaulted. Um, and they, in the paperwork, it, it reads uh, something to the effect of like, or otherwise engaged in otherwise improper behavior. <laughs> okay. Um, fast forward to 1996 and we have the U.S. Army Aberdeen scandal. So what happened there, that was an Army basic training site. Drill sergeants and other instructors were using their power to receive sexual favors from young female trainees. Um, they were assaulting them and raping them sometimes. Not every single trainee and not every single female who was harassed was assaulted, but it was happening. Um, it was at Aber Aberdeen Proving Grounds, which is an army base in Maryland. And so ultimately 12 drill instructors were charged with sex crimes. Four of the 12 were sentenced to prison. Eight others were discharged or received non-judicial punishment. So what a non-judicial punishment is, is basically an, an administrative punishment. And depending on what it is, it could, it may or may not affect your career. Right. So when you hear somebody say they got an Article 15, you don't have to go through a judicial process to get an Article 15. That would be um, a non-judicial punishment. And and an Article 15 is serious, um, but people stay in the military even after Article 15s, you know, depending on what the, the Article 15 was given for. Um, and so Major General Shadley, Robert Shadley, I think is his first name. He was the commander of Aberdeen Proving Grounds when this happened. Um, and he actually wrote a book called The Game. So if you're ever looking for a good read um, and you're okay listening or reading something a military man wrote, read that book. It does give some, some pretty good insight as to the times, the assaults that were happening, what it was like to be that commander, the choices that he had to make uh, in terms of punishment. Um, a lot of people think that, well, you're the military, you can you know, hand down these crazy punishments, but there's still a due process um, and the military system is not perfect, right? So while we think that, oh, the military can you know, really bring a hammer down, we, they, all, they can't always do that, right? So it's a really good book that he wrote, it's called The Game. Um, fast forward to 2003, we had a similar type of sexual assault scandal um, at the Air Force Academy. Um, and between 2009 and 2012, we also had um, assaults happening at Air Force Basic Training at Lackland Air Force Base. Um, the Air Force Academy, I, I will tell you that I have actually worked with a number of women in my Air Force career. I'm about to retire next month uh, after 22 years. And I have worked with a number of women who were at the academy during the time and were the victims of the assaults that were taking place. Um, let's see. Okay, so around the 2003-2004 timeframe, the 9-11 had already happened, right? We were geared up, we were overseas, we were fighting wars, whether we were National Guard or active duty, we were doing what we were trained to do. And, you know, our, our presence over there was elevated. And it was about the 2004 timeframe where some national news organizations um, basically broke the story about these um, assaults, insane numbers of assaults that were happening over in in our, what we call our AOR, the area of responsibility. So if your AOR is Thailand, 
that means that you work in Thailand or you're deployed to Thailand. If it's Afghanistan, then the AOR is Afghanistan. So that area of responsibility. Um, so anyway, so the 2003, 2004 timeframe, this new story broke and kind of what came as a result of it was um, some good stuff, some really good stuff. This is about the time where Sapper started and we'll talk about the Sapper timelines, uh, the program timelines in the next slide. 2013, we're still talking about the bad stuff. Lieutenant Colonel Krasinski, he was the Air Force chief. He was in charge of my program and he was arrested for um, allegedly sexually assaulting somebody. He was ultimately acquitted. Um, take that for what it's worth. Um, then we have 2015, uh, an Army E-7, so his rank would be a Sergeant First Class. He was doing my job. His job was to take reports of sexual assault and support victims through the process, get them their resources they needed, believe them, protect them. And he was actually, his words, I, I put that in quotes because that was his words, propositioning them. He was assaulting the victims who were coming to report to him and he was trafficking them. Um, ultimately, he pleaded guilty. Oh, I forget how much time he got. This one really kind of, this cross still sticks in me horribly. Um, he pleaded guilty to 15 counts. He was sentenced to only 24 months in prison, which means he did not go to Fort Leavenworth. So if you've all heard of, you know, the infamous Fort Leavenworth, right, don't want to go to Leavenworth. Um, you actually don't go to Leavenworth if you are a female, you go to a different prison and you don't go to Leavenworth unless you got a sentence of 11 years or higher. So this guy got 24 months confinement, busted down to E1 and he was dishonorably discharged. Um, after he was released, because at that time, the military criminal law enforcement agency systems weren't talking to civilian systems, he was actually allowed to get a job in a foster home. So um, I don't think he's working there anymore when it came to light what had happened. But yeah, he, he was in a foster home. And then, of course, 2020, 2021, we're rolling into COVID. We've got... Um, active duty soldiers arrested for sex trafficking down in the southwest border. We've got this cinder uh, tinder sailor hooker pimp um, trafficking scandal that was happening overseas, which was basically there was a madam who was running a trafficking ring in Bahrain, got angry at some sailors who were taking advantage of the services. And it just it was this whole thing. And of course, we all know trafficking is not a voluntary thing. This was this was abuse and, and violence that was happening. Um, so this was where I was up to 2020. And then we we rolled into 2021 and uh, Fort Hood and the I am Vanessa Guillen movement. Uh, the Wisconsin National Guard had a big report come out, the Vermont National Guard, Florida, West Virginia, and of course, most recently in November, the state of Maine um, made that, made the newspaper. Are we able to do hand raises in here, um, Kate? Katie, yeah. I don't use Teams, I don't use uh, Zoom very often, so. Yeah, uh, you should be, people should be able to raise their hand okay. with a reaction. So just as a, sh with a show of hands, if I could see uh, hands raised, if you, um, if you saw the newspaper articles for the state of Maine that came out in November. Okay, we got Katie, Jess, Case, Wendy, Anna, Emily, Maureen, William, Lisa. Okay, so lots of you did see that. Yeah. So that was a tough thing to process through, right? Um, and that in and of itself could be a whole other presentation. Um, at the end, if we have time for questions, if any of you do have questions, if I'm able to answer them, I absolutely will. Um, but this just, you know, I put this up here because I want you all to see that none of us are immune, right? Clearly, we do this work uh, because it's necessary, um, whether we're active duty or National Guard or in Maine or in Wisconsin or at Fort Hood. Um, what the Fort Hood situation did for us, um, just like in 2003, when that, that big TV, art, um, TV news organization broke the story about the assaults happening in the AOR, 
what Fort Hood did for us was another wake up call to Congress, to the Department of Defense that we need something different. We need something more. We're doing good hard work out here, but it's not enough, right? We're at that point where we need some, some things to change. We didn't get here overnight. We're not going to fix overnight. I am proud of the um, progress that this program has made over the years uh, since I've been in it and before, but I always tell folks we still have a lot of work to do, right? And so with Fort Hood, uh, this is really what happened. It launched us forward with this. There was a 90-day independent review commission that was um, ordered by President Biden. And the commission came back with 80, it was either 82 or 88 recommendations to the Department of Defense. And the Secretary of Defense said, yep, we're going to do all of them. Well, that's a lot. Um, and as we talked about earlier, the National Guard were always in different statuses, right? So some of those recommendations don't even pertain to us. And so we have to figure out we being, you know, at the National Guard level, and then they'll funnel it down. We have to figure out how are we going to actually do this when our laws maybe don't allow us to, right? We're a citizen soldier. As a citizen soldier, with the exception of those two days a month that I'm on duty, I enjoy all the rights and liberties as a citizen of the state of Maine. So if I commit a crime and it's, you know, on my off time from the guard, then I fall under the state of Maine laws. I don't fall under military law. Um, and so these are some of the things that we have to work through. But this independent review commission uh, has forced a lot of changes that needed to happen in order for us to make progress. Some of those changes even include changing the UCMJ. Um, that is law. That's military law. So similar to changing a law in the state of Maine or a federal law, it doesn't just happen because somebody said, oh, change it. It has to go through that whole process of, you know, creating this new law. Um, so one example of, of one of the law changes that they made is that under the UCMG, UCMJ, sexual harassment is now considered a crime in the military. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, didn't think I'd ever live to see that, but you know, when we look at how do we, how do we start to hammer down on this? Like, how do we start to get people to take it seriously that sexual harassment is the first step on that continuum of harm that leads to sexual assault, right? Well, we'll, we'll get them to pay attention one way or the other, right? So it's just a start. I'm not saying that's the ultimate fix, but that's just one example of some of the changes that, that were recommended. Um, so when we're looking at the <laughs> Excuse me. When we're looking at the program itself, um, so I mentioned that the 2003 2004 timeframe is when that uh, story came out. They initiated a task force, just like this independent review commission. It was a 90 day task force, right? Um, and so that task force got together and they did all of the things that they do, which is send out a lot of taskers saying, give us this information, give us this information. They do surveys, they do interviews, investigations, um, lots of stuff. 90 days later, they reported back um, and created the Joint Task Force for Sexual Assault uh, Prevention and Response. Ultimately, as a result of that task force, the SAPR program, this program that I work under, came um, what we call live or hot on 1 January of 05. Um, lots of changes lots of changes. Um, if we fast forward to about 2012 timeframe, um, this is when, uh, if you remember from the previous slide, that's about the timeframe that Colonel Krasinski was arrested. Um, Sergeant First Class McQueen was running the trafficking ring down in Texas. Lots of things were still happening. We were doing good work, but, but there weren't a lot of controls on who was allowed to be a sapper professional. And we didn't even call them sapper professionals back then. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, there were a lot of part, lots of parts of this program that weren't even accessible to the National Guard. We weren't allowed to do what we call a restricted report, what out in the civilian side we call a confidential report. We weren't even allowed to do that in the National Guard. Um, but all this stuff happened around the 2012 timeframe. And so they said, you know what? We got to make some changes. And so that is when they started working with NOVA. So most of you should be familiar with NOVA. That's the national organization, right? 
<clears throat> so um, the Department of Defense worked with NOVA to create a program for uh, credentialing of our SAPR folks. So now in order to be in the program, you have to go through an extended background screening. So somebody could actually have a top secret security clearance, but not be qualified to be a victim advocate. Um, because you can keep a clearance with certain um, transgressions. Let's just say transgressions because everybody makes mistakes, right? You can keep a security clearance with some, some transgressions, certain ones, but not be qualified for um, being a sapper professional. So um, operating under the influence. If you've ever, ever had a DUI or an OUI. Uh, you would not be able to be a SAPR professional because that's just one of those things that the program says that's a judgment call issue. No, can't have it. If you've ever been arrested for domestic violence, for child abuse, if you've ever had uh, a sexual harassment um, complaint against you, if you've ever had sexual assault allegations against you, whether you had a conviction or not, any of these things pop up, you don't get to be part of the program. So they really tightened down um, who they were going to allow to be part of the program. Um, and 2013 is when our first credentialed SAPR professionals hit the street, right? Um, and those of us who were already in the program, we had to do a lot of fancy footwork to you know, get paperwork in. They, they had to redo our training to meet NOVA um, expectations. Uh, and there was a lot of house cleaning that happened. Um, I remember one of the command that I was at at the time, um, it was, I was doing an active duty tour and the person who was acting as the SARC um, had to be relieved of duty as the SARC because they had punched their spouse in the face, you know, just stuff like that. Like those were the folks that were working uh, doing that job. And it was, it was kind of sad because a lot of them were stepping up because they thought, oh, if I step up and I do this special duty, it'll look good on my eval and then I'll get promoted, right? That'll be points for promotion. And the DOD said, no, nah, we're not having that anymore. Um, and so there were, there were lots of folks who stepped down. <clears throat> and not only did it affect them working in this job, but because they did that extended background screening, a lot of them got in trouble militarily because they found these things that they had done that they hadn't self-reported. And if the conviction hadn't happened yet, or they didn't get convicted, then the command might not never know, right? So there was lots of house cleaning that happened. Um, one of the downfalls to the program up until about 2015 was that in the National Guard, we did not have full-time people doing my job. Um, and that really was horrible because the person who, was, who the duty was assigned to was what we call our executive officer. Now the executive officer is somebody between the rank of 03 and 05 who works directly for the wing commander, which is a full bird colonel, and their job is full time to support that commander. So when do they have time to do sapper? When do they have time to take a disclosure, to provide support services, to go to court, to follow up, to do the training, all the things that are required when we do this work for folks, right? This is not a part time need for somebody who needs us. Um, oh, by the way, they worked for the wing commander. And so it really was a, it was a huge barrier to reporting. Uh, and so if you ever sit through any of my other classes where we talk about specific statistics, um, you'll see that pre 2015 ish, the National Guard numbers um, were fairly low. Uh, and part of that had to do with the accessibility and the availability of a SARC, um, and then the comfort level of who that SARC worked directly for. So 2015, we got our full-time um, SARC positions. They were really sporadic at first. Some units even kept that person a uniformed SARC. So it would be somebody doing the job that I do, but they were still in the military. Um, and there's been a lot of conversation about whether that is a barrier to reporting. Um, and it certainly is for some, right? Like if, I, if I'm a higher ranking person and it's a really junior person that wants to report, my rank might scare them from reporting. Um, but in the same argument, 
some folks aren't comfortable coming to a civilian they know nothing about. So it's, you know, I think there's some barriers either way. The trick is just how do we work around those, right? And, and so we do. Um, 2019, this is, this is one of my programs, that's not my program, but it's one of the programs that I absolutely love. It's one of the big changes pre uh, Fort Hood. Uh, but it's called the CATCH program. So in 2015, Congress said to the Department of Defense, we want you to get a grip on the serial offenders, right? We love that you're giving your people a restricted reporting option, but we want you to get a grip on serial offenders. Um, and so figure it out. And so Department of Defense, they got all their smart people together and they created what's called the CATCH program. So the CATCH program is a law enforcement tool um, and it gives folks who file a, a, a restricted report or what you would call a confidential report, it gives folks an opportunity to input any information they may know about their reported offender into this law enforcement database in the hopes that it will make a, a match in the system. So you've got these analysts that are above the investigators, you know, the level above the investigators who just analyze this data daily. And um, so let's, and no identifying information for the victim survivor goes into this system. It's all based on a case number. So let's say I'm working with an airman who wants to participate in catch. And the only information that they know about their reported offender is that the offender is a female with short brown hair um, and she smells like cigarette smoke and she's got a snake tattoo on her arm. So if that's all they know, then that's what they put in. But if the analysts are going through all this information and they're like, hey, wait a minute, we've got two other people who put in here that their reported offender is a female who smells like cigarette smokes with short brown hair and a snake tattoo, maybe we have a match. So what happens then, <coughs> that case number is attached to me as the SARC. So the, it, the analysts will call down and they'll say, hey, Bobby Joe, your case number 456, it looks like there's a match in the system. Can you go talk to them and see what they'd like to do? And so when that happens, I will contact the client and say, hey, it looks like there might be a match. What, we'll talk about their options. What would you like to do? And then they get to make a decision. So they can choose to unrestrict their uh, report and proceed with an investigation. They can choose to keep their report restricted and leave their information in the system, or they can keep their report restricted and remove their information from the system. So they have three choices, um, but it's their choice. It's voluntary all the way. They don't have to even participate in the first place. Um, but let's say there were three potential matches and my client says, I don't wanna participate. I wanna stay restricted. I don't wanna do this. I can't do this right now. I'm not ready for this. But the other two people say, oh yeah, we're gonna do this. The information that ends up being sent down to investigators is only the information from the two who said they would go forward. Any information from my client that said they didn't want to participate does not get sent down to the investigator. So the investigators only get to work off from the two matches, not the three, and they won't even know that there's a third batch. That information stays totally separate. So really cool program. Um, August 2019, we went live. Um, they've started, you know, in this past six or eight months, giving us numbers, showing us matches that are happening. Um, folks have been taken to a court martial. Um, so the, the program is working. Um, I remember when it first came out, uh, I think we were in a DV task force meeting and um, Candace Sable said, gosh, I really wish we had that on the civilian side and it would be a great thing, right? Um, but the truth is, if it so happens that this reported offender is a civilian, at some point it could help the civilian side, right? So it's not a civilian law enforcement tool. It is a military law enforcement tool, um, but there could be the potential that, that it helps. Um, Abby, do I, I just want to offer a check-in that you have about half an hour left. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, great. You put all that stuff in there. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All it's right. It's mostly just me in the chat. <laughs> That's what I was checking just to make sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to jump ahead a little bit here. Um, 
oh, did I lock? Okay, so these are numbers. These are old numbers, FY19 numbers. You don't need to know numbers. I just want you to know that it happens. If you really want to see the numbers for the Department of Defense, you can go to sapper.mil. Um, there's lots of military resources on there in terms of um, our regulations and those sorts of things. But there's also, we are required to present an annual report to the president every year. And all of those reports are on there. So if you're truly interested in uh, seeing what those numbers look like, then uh, by all means, go ahead. Um, this next slide is just a little, re it's a little recap of what the FY19 numbers were for the National Guard. Uh, and I broke it out into Air and Army, as well as Title 32 and Title 10, right? So you look at all these different combinations you could make in terms of um, in terms of support services and those sort, sorts of things. Um, I, I think the key takeaway that I want you folks to have with this particular piece of information is not the numbers themselves, because there's a lot of data that you could you could garner from those reports, right? Um, but what are, what are these numbers actually saying? So when I tell you that in FY19, there were 634 reports made in the National Guard, that does not mean that 634 National Guard members assaulted somebody in the National Guard. What that means is that 634 people who experienced sexual assault at any point in their life came forward and said, I would like some help. This could be childhood assault. This could be assault in the military, but by a civilian. And this could be assault while in the military, but at the hands of a fellow military member. So when we look at numbers, um, whether it is, um, you know, listening to the House Armed Services Committee, yesterday or a presentation like this or that sort of thing, take those numbers with a grain of salt and figure out what exactly are those numbers saying because um, the, the numbers don't always mean what people tend to jump to. Um, and, and again, our program is not just for those who um, have experienced assault at the hands of a military member, it's anybody in our who's eligible, who has experienced it. Okay, so um, let's talk about eligibility and reporting options real quick. This, this could be a three hour um, block in and of itself. So I am gonna kind of breeze through it. Um, Katie, I'll remind me to send you some of these handouts that coincide with this. Okay. Um, I meant to do that earlier and I totally forgot. We've got some really nice slick sheets that explain it. Cool. Um, so there is a specific eligibility, right? Not just anybody who knows a military member can report. So uh, for active duty members, their dependents, as long as they're 18 years and older, um, they can report. Um, Air Force, Army, Reserve, and National Guard, they can report and they have the option for the two different reporting types. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, in the Air Force, even our civilian employees, are eligible to report. Now, being eligible to report does not necessarily mean eligible for all of the services, right? So when we look on the other side of this um, slide, on the right side, eligibility is 100% based on a status, okay? Um, and so that is something that my office can help work through and figure out what support services through the military are actually available. If the if the member was on uh, an actual military status at the time, then they're probably going to be eligible for what we call a line of duty determination, which means that the VA will take care of that injury for the rest of their lives. So if that injury is a physical injury or PTS, anything like that, that's going to be connected to that line of duty. Um, so, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to make your brains all scrambled eggs by getting into all of these little things, because it really just depends. Um, I need you to see this. I need you to see all these differences so that you can truly tell yourself as a civilian, I can't be an expert at this. I'm going to call Bobby Joe, or I'm going to call Tina, our JFHQ SARC. Um, but it's really important even to, to acknowledge, if you look to the right side, 
our contractors, our government contractors, um, if they're here in the, like, so we have contractors who work at the base in Bangor. If they experience sexual assault, then other than doing a warm handoff to a community partner, I can't provide them any services. But if I'm in a deployed location and one of our contractors experiences a sexual assault, there are some, some support services and eligibility for them because we're in a deployed situation. So, you know, um, just kind of one of those crazy things. One of the things that I do want to point out before we, we press on from this one, when the reported offender and the victim survivor are in a relationship in the context of whether that's spousal, boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend, just domestic partnership of any sort, if they share a child in kind, even if they've never lived together, but they share a, a child in kind, um, or any, any of our dependents who are 17 or younger, I cannot provide support services to them. I am not going to turn them away. I'm not going to just say, hey, go away. You know, this is a, an interpersonal violence situation. I'm not going to turn them away. Um, but what I am going to do is connect them with uh, either the family advocacy program or what we call our director of psychological health. Um, and there's a reason for that. In, in our program, when we go through our training and our day-to-day -day work that we do, we're not necessarily trained up and equipped as a program to handle all of the things that come with domestic violence. Um, we all know that's a different bear, um, not a bear that we ever want to poke, and it's definitely not a bear that we want to mishandle. And so we, we work with a different group of specialists who can work around and work with those um, safety factors and just the family factors too, right? I mean, there's just so much that comes into play. Um, and then of course, 17 and, and under being juvenile, um, we, can't, we can't support them. So when something like that, when somebody re, re, uh, reports to me and it's, it's a family situation like this or an interpersonal uh, relationship, um, what I will do is have a conversation with them about that. Um, and explain what that looks like and that I'm not gonna leave them until I have them connected with somebody. And as long as they're okay with that, then we'll work on getting them connected with other people. Um, and so it's important to, to recognize that as well. Now, that being said, I'm not gonna tell you if you're working with somebody and it was domestic violence, sexual assault, don't call me, call me. I will get you connected with our people that are gonna help them. Um, but just recognize that it's going to be more than just me that gets involved in that mix. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, just quick. They say pineapple juice helps with that. So we have um, two different reporting options for our folks. We have what we call unrestricted and restricted. Um, this is just a little chart that kind of shows reporting and notification process based on uh, the two options. Um, we have a group of folks within our military ranks who are considered mandatory reporters. So legally, congressionally mandated, if you are a commander, if you are in the chain of command of the person reporting to you, if you are law enforcement, so our security forces folks, if you are one of our attorneys, unless you're the victim's attorney, um, then you fall within that mandatory report um, category. So if one of our members discloses to their commander that they experience a sexual assault, then the commander is required to notify law enforcement. By law, they have to, by, by our military law, they have to notify law enforcement. Will you say that again? So if, if one of our members or one of our eligible folks who, who has eligibility for the program reports to a mandatory reporter, like a commander, mm -hmm. then their only option is an unrestricted report. Okay. So, um, and, and that is- you know who those are, who the mandatory reporters are versus not? They do. That's something that we teach in our annual training. And it's, um, you know, there sometimes there's some sketchy things that happen. I don't mean sketchy in a bad way. I mean questionable. So what I mean by sketchy is I had a first sergeant call me one time and beside himself saying, Bobby Joe, this person is in my office and they just told me that they were sexually assaulted and I don't know what to do. And they are 
fallen out on the floor and I don't think they meant to tell me, but now I know and I'm supposed to report it. And, and the first sergeant's losing their mind because they didn't want to report it because they knew that that's not what the victim wanted. But they are required by law to report it. So what we did was we said, hey, uh, let me call our attorney. So I did a hypothetical with the attorney and said, hey, hypothetically speaking, if somebody was having a bit of an emotional crisis and did not mean to tell a, a mandatory reporter, is there anything we can do to support that person from the restricted, unrestricted side? In that situation, we were able to, but this was with legal guidance, we were able to say, okay, first sergeant, as long as you don't tell any other mandatory reporter, we can offer this victim a restricted report. But if you decide in your conscience that you can't let this sit, then this person is gonna lose that option. So it's up to you. Uh, and in that case, that first sergeant knew that the best thing emotionally for that victim survivor was that we did a restricted report. Um, and so it worked out okay. That person actually converted to unrestricted and went through with an investigation three months later. They just needed that time to, to get okay. Um, but the, the mandatory reporters, we, we talk that all the time, we teach it. Uh, for those folks who are mandatory reporters, they have training, like commanders have to do training with me within 30 days of taking command. Um, so we talk about what that looks like. We talk about how to talk to your folks. If it sounds like the conversation's going that way, TV timeout, hey, it sounds like you're going in this direction. And if you confirm that to me, I have to report it. So how about we get you talking to somebody else, unless you're okay with me reporting this to law. And yeah. so it kind of goes that way. Um, there are some changes coming down about the reporting, but it's not going to change so drastically for you folks that it'll make a difference. So we'll save that for next year's training. Um, with an unrestricted report, were you going to say more minutes. 15 more minutes as well? Oh, goodness. Okay. So I told you I love this program. So with an unrestricted report, law enforcement may or may not investigate. That's their call. Um, they're entitled to services, they're entitled to things like uh, an expedited transfer, which would be a transfer to another base and some other, other services. Um, downside to an unrestricted report is that a few more people know about the assault than what the victim might be comfortable with, but that's, you know, that's part of going through the process of an investigation, right? If we switch over to the restricted report, there are three groups of folks who are allowed to take a restricted report. So that is myself and my SAPR VAs, my SAPR professionals, um, and then healthcare personnel. So as long as the victim survivor tells one of the three of us, then they can still maintain that restricted report. They get all the same support services in terms of advocacy, mental health, uh, medical, if it you know, is, is indicated, a safe exam, all of those sorts of things, they get all that. What they don't get with a restricted report are the things that would come with command. The, the reported offender won't be held accountable, right? Because there's no investigation. Um, if they live in the same barracks or they work in the same place as the reported offender, they can't get a transfer because we need a commander's approval for that, right? And so if the command doesn't know, they can't transfer. And if they know, then it's a mandatory report. So again, one of those things to understand is that because we have these different reporting options, um, good to call us to figure you know, those, those pieces out. Not gonna go through all of this because I just talked it all, but these are the available services for restricted and unrestricted reporting with some tweaks that will come after this NDAA is finally signed. Okay. Um, let's just talk about military sexual trauma real quick. Um, I talked about it a little bit in the beginning, right? Like using the uh, analogy of the first sergeant is kind of like a parent not believing you. Um, and really that's what we've kind of recognized is that military sexual trauma um, kind of equates to incest, right? It's a trusted teammate. It's somebody that you might have to work with for a long time. Um, it breaks that bond, right? We all go through basic training and, and do these training details to build this bond because we have to go fight wars and protect our country and you know sexual assault in the military breaks that bond um if a victim requests a transfer that's basically starting over it's their request but it doesn't change the fact that they may have to start over um this can oftentimes of course result in complex trauma um 
and with our male victims, we're often looking at more, um, oftentimes they're not recognizing it as being sexual assault. So we're looking at like hazing type situations where you and I all know that a lot of that is sexual assault, but it's just boys being boys. Um, you know, sometimes there's that old fashioned uh, toxic masculinity. Uh, there's no room for weakness, even, you know, men and women, it doesn't matter. Um, there's just, there's a lot. Sometimes there's perceived um, threats to the career, right? If I report this person, then my career is going to get tanked. Um, most of the time that doesn't happen, but it is a perceived threat, right? And it's something that our folks have to think about. And so military sexual trauma, when you're looking at how the VA recognizes it, um, keep in mind too that it's not just specific to sexual assault. The VA recognizes within that definition, military sexual uh, trauma is sexual harassment and sexual assault, right? Uh, if I'm experiencing sexual harassment over the course of 15 years from the same person, that can have the very same effects, right? Uh, the trauma effects of, of an assault pot potentially. Um, my thing doesn't want to always go. So we have some DOD specific resources. I already talked about the catch program that what you're seeing on the right side, Katie, that's the slick sheet that I'm going to send to you. Um, and, and then the previous slides when I was talking about the reporting options and the um, support services and, avail and availability, that is also a slick sheet that I'm going to send to you. So I'm not going to dig into this. We already talked about this. One of our um, Department of Defense um, resources that we have is the Safe Helpline. It is an app. It is a conversation on a phone call. Um, it is a website. They have chat rooms. And just as some back information, um, RAIN, the organization RAIN, is actually the organization that runs this. It's their platform, and they, they uh, manage the Safe Helpline for us. Okay, so in the state of Maine uh, and some other stuff, um, I need to move my little window here so I can see what I'm reading. So on the left-hand side, um, we have a 24-hour hotline number for the Maine Air National Guard. That's the top number. And then my number is the next one down. Um, I mentioned that we have a JFHQ. So JFHQ stands for Joint Force Headquarters. And that is uh, down in Augusta. Um, that's Miss Tina Zabrick and her numbers are there. So she manages, she does the same job as me, but for the Army side of the house. Um, on the air side, uh, we have Tracy Souza, who is our Director of Psychological Health, recognized too that the Army has an equivalent to all of these. Um, it becomes a very full, ugly, lots of information, can't read it slide. Um, so I can get that information to you in another form. Um, we also have vet centers. These are some of our local resources that we have. And then TOGUS, the VA center. Um, we're learning some things about um, being treated for military sexual trauma at the VA. Um, some uh, I can't even think the word I'm looking for, but some discrepancies in the information being put out. Uh, from one MST coordinator to another at the different VAs in the different states. So we're going to clarify that a little bit more with some folks higher up. Um, I was going right um, to ask about that, Bobby Joe. So it would be super great for you to loop back because I was yeah. going to tell these folks we have a pretty old webinar at this point on military sexual trauma through the mm -hmm. VA. So if you have yep. someone who's discharge retired their veteran and and they're reflecting back on their career and thinking I might need support or I might have rights to things it's yeah. a webinar on how to to access those resources but it's I mean it's at least five years old so I would imagine it's time for us has there been updates substantial enough to there have been a few and so I would expect that um I'm trying to think of when it's like two months ago that I was last on the VA site um they should have updated um videos if they have fixed if they have updated those videos um i i think the really big takeaway to this is for us to recognize that getting support for military sexual trauma at the va is a process it is not as easy as just walking into the va and saying hey 
here's my DD form 2910 and I need support in getting it. It doesn't work that way. So if we're looking to, to uh, more immediate support, that's when we want to turn to our vet centers, our DOD safe helpline, maybe our director of psychological health or some of our other community partners. Um, because the, the VA, it's just, it's a long process. Um, and then of course I've thrown some of our DOD stuff over on the other side. Um, I put military one source here because that's a great resource for folks who have filed an unrestricted report, <clears throat> but it's super important to remember that military one source is not a confidential report. It is, they have a requirement to report if somebody discloses to them that they experienced the assault. Um, so yeah, uh, important to remember that. All right. And um, current charge our current challenges. Um, we have a varied number of things that we, we train on. We have some mandated stuff that is specific to the program that Congress says you will teach this every year. Um, and then we have other stuff that we uh, teach based on the position that folks hold within the unit. Um, recognize that we do an awful lot of training with not a lot of time and it changes. So one example of uh, what we have been using in the past is the, the company Altruistic and they've done a lot with the green dot training, right? And so we're evolving out of that and into some new stuff, especially with these new changes. Um, but our folks do get a lot of training. Sometimes that's the downfall, right? because they're getting so much training that maybe they're just straight checking out all the time. Uh, and, and that's understandable, totally understandable. Um, challenges for us, geographical challenges, Maine is huge, right? So how do I get to the county to support one of our members that lives up there? How do I get to Connecticut to support one of our members that lives there who comes up here once a month for drill? Um, so advocacy can be a challenge, accessibility can be a challenge. If I've got a a victim in um, Connecticut, I don't know the resources in Connecticut. So making those connections with our um, Connecticut SARC counterparts, super, super important. Um, some of our other challenges that we're slowly working through, but always going to be a challenge is that, you know, that crusty old um, good old boy system, you know, whether, it, and I'll tell you, I grew up in a main family and I listen at family reunions and I hear it in my family too. So it's not just a military thing. It's just a crusty old thing, which is why I wrote crusty old instead of good old boys. Um, and just the military having a bad rep, right? Um, this hearing happened yesterday. We made the news in November. Um, Vermont made the news last year. But when was the last time you heard a good news story? We're doing great things. But we don't get that out there, right? Because we're too busy doing the work to worry about, hey, look at us, look at us, right? We're doing the work. And then all of a sudden, you know, some of the negative stuff comes up. So that's a challenge too, working around that and maintaining that trust uh, with our folks who need to trust us um, if they want to have a successful support experience. Um, so these are just some of our challenges. My ask, mm -hmm. my ask to all of you would be, um, as I said before, Remember that we're here. Um, our folks are not required to report to us, but that doesn't mean that you can't call us with hypothetical questions so that you can support them better. Um, but knowing that we have this program um, and that there are these different nuances and so forth um, is super helpful for you to realize that there are other resources available for military members. Um, and so reach out to us. I think, I think the information that I have on here really does kind of say it all for you. I don't need to get too deep into this. Um, if they don't know if they're eligible, let us figure that out, you know, call us and give us a hypothetical. Um, we can, we can answer those questions for you without you breaking their confidentiality. Um, it, it, and we do do that. So, okay. So I rushed through the last few. But I think I got them all in there. You sure did. Do we, have, do we have time for questions? We have time for a couple of questions if folks have them. Good job. <laughs> um, oh, Casey says she could listen to you all day. Thank oh, you. Thank you. And, and you know, just while if we're waiting for some questions to pop in here or somebody to jump on, do not hesitate to call me. Yeah. I My thing is like, I need you folks to know this. I can't support 
my people without your support. And, and, and sometimes you're not going to be able to support your people without my support. We're, we're going to, we're going to cross over. So, um, oh, thanks, Amanda. Yeah. Let me type in my, um, my, my government cell phone is probably the best one. The, the number that Katie put in there is my, um, your office, I think my office and I am not going to lie. I am so busy these days that I'm not in the office very often. Um, so I put my my Sark cell in there. Thank you. I wasn't sure which one. You have so many. Numbers. I love the fur babies. Case, thank you. Yeah, and like I mentioned earlier too, uh, uh, Katie gave you the slides, so you've got that for back information. Um, and whether it is the news articles that came out in November, um, the the House Armed Services Committee hearing yesterday, um, or um, just somebody that you've been working with or questions you have, don't hesitate to call. You know, there's good and bad to that media coverage. Um, some folks had some things they felt like they needed to say, and they got them out. Um, but from a reporter standpoint too, right, that those reporters are doing the best they can with what they've gotten. They don't have all the information either. So if, if something in there is not setting well with you and you would like a clearer picture of it, please reach out to me. I would rather you understand that uh, than not. I, I do have a quick question that to, yes. to ask. Um, how many safes and sanes do you have at Togus right now None. to kind of help out with this? None. I oh I don't know that they have any, quite honestly. Um, so the V so Togus is a Veterans Administration Hospital. It's not a military hospital. It's a completely different organization. In the state of Maine, we do not have a military medical treatment facility uh, that would constitute being a military hospital, if you will, where we would typically have scenes. We do have a clinic down in Portsmouth at the shipyard. Um, that's a Navy clinic where some of our folks get to go, but as far as having military SANES here in the state of Maine, I don't, none in the National Guard. Let me, let me backpedal that. In the National Guard as a military organization in the state of Maine, we don't have any, but we actually have one of our Air National Guard members who just got her certification as a SANE. Yes, and so I am so excited about her. Her last name is Porter, and she's an amazing human being. And I just found out last month that she got her, her um, credentialing for that. And I was like, yay! So she can't do safes for us at the unit. Um, but if it came down to it, if she happens to be on rotation, she might be the one that, that responds to us. But Now tell me, um, Sean, do you work with the same program? Or is that where your question is coming from? Because I heard you talking about it earlier. I do, yes. Yeah, I am, uh, I am the Southern Maine coordinator for the UNE SANE program. It, we're aiming to recruit and train new nurses who gotcha. want to become safe th through, throughout the state. So that's, gotcha. I'm coming from that side of it. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that's awesome. And we do have nurses in the guard. Um, so if you need more nurses trained that they, they would be great people, uh, to, to talk to, but as far as actually having them operate within our treatment facility, we don't have a treatment facility. Yeah. Thanks. That was a good question. Amanda, were you going to say something? It looked like you unmuted and then muted or. I was just going to say that, um, we have lots of volunteers too that we steal from you. So we have had um, one volunteer working with us for going on two years now, and he is so fabulous and does- Would his initials be PW? Yes. <laughs> and he, we were like praising him last night because he is like, you know, it's been two years and I just got my first talking call. And since then I've had three. But he's oh. done so many accompaniments for us that we didn't yes, even he, realize he hadn't had any talking calls. So, yeah. um, but it's it's incredible to have someone with that experience and also, um, you know, someone who identifies as male to support 
yeah. you know, survivors who are looking for that type of support. So it's awesome. And I was him. so sad when I found out when he, he came and told me he was going to get out of the military. It was so sad. Aww. He's awesome. He's one so of our good ones. Uh, I also want to offer just as you all have identified, there's a lot more conversations to have here. I feel like I steal a fair amount of Bobby and Tina's time because they're statewide programs and we're statewide programs. So we sort of like, you know, they're the ones we invite to trainings and check in on things. And when the articles came out, we checked base, touch base. So, but, but it just is a reminder that they're all just as available for you all. And so if there's a conversation you want to have out of this, that there's a staff meeting or there's like, um, maybe we would have a phase two of this conversation. Um, happy to do it because you just provide such a strong partnership and perspective and are doing such good work and we want to stay connected whenever we can. Absolutely. And it's so important. And, you know, when we have, we have these monthly calls with the National Guard Bureau, so all the SARCs from across the country get on. And I listened to, um, you know, we did our training last week. And one of the things I tasked our students with is they had to come to class and they had to tell us how many SANES they have in their state. They had to tell us um, what their state coalition was called and um, what their closest uh, community uh, support organization was called. And even SARCs who were active didn't know about state coalitions. And so it just made me realize in Tina, we were kind of like, we, we kind of have it good here in Maine because we have this really great working relationship with all of our community partners around the state. And that's super helpful. And not every state has that working relationship. So I would throw that piece that Katie just said, bye Casey, thank you. Um, I would throw that real quick, um, I guess is my last piece, unless there's more questions. If there's something in this presentation that you would want to hone in on more for a training, um, this was just like a military 101 kind of a thing. If there's something that you would want to hone in on more and do a, a different training on, like just the reporting options or what the process looks like for us or whatever, let me know that we'll build something and we'll come back and we'll do a different training. Um, and it can be an off cycle, right? Like Sean, if you or, or Paula or Amanda, anybody wants to do something on their own and set it up and then just invite the other folks, absolutely, we can do that. Um, just You just have to let me know and give me enough time to build something. Thank you so much, Bobby Joe. I super appreciate it. And I'm gonna pop, stop the recording. <laughs>